Thank you, Elder Francis. Great. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to see so many faces here. And those in the balcony, balcony, if you could see me, of course you can, the camera's pointed at me. Welcome. Today we are gonna continue again. Yeah, we have seven churches, yeah? This is the sixth one. And I promise to finish it. I promise to go through it. And somebody was asking me in the back there, yeah, are you still in Revelations? Um, I said, yes, I am. By the grace of God, I might be continuing it after this as well. There's a lot of things to bring out, all right? And a lot of things we want to share and a lot of, a lot of things the Lord is teaching. Now, what has done in me as a teacher of the Word of God, God is holding me even more responsible than you, all right, for what I, what I say, what because I, I have to practice what I preach. All right, and God is holding that. Those who are teachers, those who want to minister the word of God and share the word of God, that is so fine. You want to become a minister, that's great. Remember, God is holding you accountable, more accountable than those who you teach. Now, those who hear the word of God, you are still accountable, you know, because you hear the word of God, and like a mirror, you look at it, you know, I'm not lining up properly. My face looking, I need a little bit more. This grease on my face, this piece of dirt, or what do you call it, wappy in my eye, and all that stuff. Or is it the eye or the lip? Why well, I can't much more wappy is. Wipe it off, clean it off, right? Make your face to shine according to the word of God. But if we look into the word of God and we see that we need changes and we say, eh, and they walk away, God is going to hold you accountable for that. Okay? All this is saying is, um, the book of Revelations also says, blessed is he who hears and reads the book, the words of this book. 
Every time that's the word of God says, read Revelation chapter 1. I can't go into that again. All right? Just because we're talking about Revelation, God is blessing you for hearing it, and God is blessing us for reading it. All right? That's the only book in the Bible, as somebody says, has the audacity to say, read me, I have a blessing. All right? And remember, the book of Revelation is Mark, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all inspired by God. Revelation was dictated by Jesus Christ. God himself. That's a unique thing about Revelations. Do afraid Revelations. All right? People just run from Revelation. It is fantastic. And the last of all, as a summary again, all of Scripture comes together in Revelation. Revelation is like the beginning of the new beginning. Everything in the Word of God culminates, come together in a point in Revelation because it's about Things are about to change. We are about to enter into the place where we were designed to go. We have been preparing to go. It's on the brink of entering into the new dimension in Jesus Christ. I won't say new age, but you know, because new age have a bad connotation. But into the new dimension of Jesus Christ and his will and his preparation. Why we were created in the first place. And it's going to last forever forever. Of course, there's two places, but we're focusing on one today. Nice. So, we're looking at the Philadelphia Church, and we're going to look and address this um, from Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 7. So we go through it quickly, get an idea what's going on, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse and see what the Lord is saying to us. This, and I cannot be exhaustive. I'm sure as you read the Word of God, as you read Revelations, everything I've said, God willing, I say today, you will find more because the whole Word of God comes together in Revelation. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of the one who is holy and true who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door, which no one can shut. For you have only a little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Look. Look at those who belong to the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, but are liars instead. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know, they will know that I love you. Because you have kept my word, sorry, because you have kept my commandment to press persevere, I also I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never again leave it. Upon him, I will write, I will write the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, that comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is addressed to Philadelphia. It's addressed to all of us. It is addressed to us today. Don't say it's for them alone. It's for us. And you'll know it's for us because at the end they always have some encouragement. If those who overcome will have and all these wonderful things, that also applies to us. So all these things, scriptures that we see now, we have to hold on to it. God's word, as you see in some hints there, we have to hold on to it and we have to grip it. We can't let it slide. But I get it ahead of myself. So let's go back to the beginning. Okay. Philadelphia, quickly. We're not going to spend too much on the geography and history of Philadelphia because there's so much to look at. One, Philadelphia means brotherly love. It comes to the word brotherly love. 
Unfortunately, that's not going to be the, um, <laughs> the title of this message. Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. No, I don't see it that way. Philadelphia, the church with the open door. I'm going to put it, the church with the open door, which is us. We'll see why I chose that. Because by reading this and understanding this, this has changed something in my life. Yes, it has recently, again younger, but the word of God is still working in me. And I know the word of God is working in you as we go from strength to strength, glory to glory, towards the stature of Jesus Christ. We reach there yet? No, we have a long way to go. I have a long way to go. You have a long way to go. So Lee, there is plenty room to go further upwards. We ain't reach yet. Just saying, okay? So, brotherly love is the name of Philadelphia. That's where it came from. It's a place that had a lot of earthquakes. They always mashing up with earthquakes, you know, earthquakes in diverse places. They must have thought the law was coming, and they were right. The law could come anytime. Earthquakes all over the place in, um, in, in um, Philadelphia. They always rebuilding. They used to call it like the little Athens, you know, the Athens, the big city in Rome, because of the number of temples that they had there. So there are plenty of people worshiping pagan gods. Like every church we know so far has a whole heap of false religions, temples to idols all over the place. This was no exception. And it wasn't too far from Sardis. We talked about Sardis last time. But anyway, I don't want to go through no more geography here. I say that's now help us too much. Revelations, as we say, let's look at the address from verse 3, chapter 3, verse 7. All right? Jesus Christ introduced himself as the only, as the one who is holy and true. We know that. He is holy. Be holy, even as I am holy. That's what God asks us to do, commands us to do. All right? And he is true. He is the truth. You know, today, as we always hear, there is your truth, and then there is the truth. Everybody has their own truth, you know? People have fallen the vain imaginations. God said it's going to happen. It was always happening. There's nothing new. It's my truth. There's your truth, and then there is the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. Everything aligns to him. If whatever you're seeing doesn't align with God, with Jesus Christ, with the word of God, it ain't truth. All right? Good. We have to hold that standard up. Don't let that standard fall or wobble. Now, a strange thing. Who holds the key of David? Hmm? He holds the key of David. David have a key. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. So this is what Jesus describes himself as he comes before the church. He made a separate, special description of himself to meet the needs and the purpose of the church he was addressing. God knows how to come to you and know exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you need. He's not going to come with a generic statement, you know, say, trust in God. You know, people say that, have faith in God. I mean, that's all he could offer me as an encouragement. Give me something. Uh, and every, you know, these kind of words, we just generalize. God is good. You know, that one. It is good. It's true. But we encourage you another by saying God is good. Uh, yeah, right, I know that, but tell me something else now that I want. I'm going through a problem right now. That is so generic. It's so broad. God tailor makes his answer to you for your situation personally. He has time to do that, and he's big enough to do that. He tailor makes his address to you personally to fit your personal needs and wants and situation. That's why he's a personal God. That's why you have to know him personally, not generally. So what is this key thing about David? All right? First of all, God has chosen, in a nutshell, God has chosen Israel in the beginning because of Abraham, not because Israel was good. And he chose the children of Abraham, specifically Isaac, all right, shows that to carry on his name and to show to the world his glory and um, to bring through these people, Isaac, the children of Isaac, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. All right, he chose that. Satan has been trying to destroy that ever since the beginning. 
right? Ever since Cain came on board and Cain, and the, um, Cain murdered his, um, his brother, that was the beginning. Because the moment you say, your seed of the woman shall, bru shall bruise the head of the seed of the serpent, all kind of thing like that, Satan started to make plan. If I could destroy the seed of the woman, I win. God plan gone through, all right? Now, God made David, the throne of David, as it were, his throne. He said the throne of David, when David sets up the throne, right, he is going to allow it to reign forever. He is the root of, of, um, of David, the root and a branch. I don't go through all that definition right now, too much things. But he is the root and the branch of David, right? And he also heard another thing about him. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. All right? He's the lion, not the lion cub. As Judah was here, like a lion cub. But he was the lion of the tribe of Judah. So out of Judah, out of God's people, the Messiah, our Savior, was coming. Satan tried to lick them up with Pharaoh. He tried to lick them up with Herod. He tried to lick him up with various parts of um, the Roman Empire. He tried to lick them up with Hitler. And he's still trying to lick them up with what's going on right now. You know the thing about from the river to the sea? Some countries think they're going to be free, right? Free of what? Not free to have the land, free of God's Jews. Because if he could lick off all the Jews now, Jesus is going to have to come with the key of David, which is the authority of... Um, of heaven and earth, right? He's going to continue the throne of David on earth. And if we could look up everybody in Israel and everybody related to Israel, he can't do that. So this part of scripture, he holds the keys of David and he's coming to rule the earth, hmm, may not happen. You see the plan of Satan? Satan has long-term plans, you know. He wrong, he go lose. But this is what is going on right now. I ain't saying the um, Israelites are God-fearing people, not necessarily all of them, but God has some plans for them. Anyway, that's a quick, it's too quick a summary, I'm sorry, because I can't go into details, because I want to get into, um, there are a couple of things I want to get to. Isaiah chapter 22, reading from verse 20. This is where the key of David was first mentioned. So let me go back to history there. On that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash around him. Hmm? He is talking about somebody else who was before Eliakim, who had the key of David, but he messed it up. He won't think for himself. He was making his own tomb, because you know, in those days, like the pharaohs make this huge tomb to glorify his name. He was making a tomb out of rock to glorify his name. I'm such a good man, everybody have to worship me and all that stuff. And God said, no, I taken that authority away from you and I'm giving it to this guy called Eliakim. All right, and I'm gonna give him your robe and your sash and I'll put your authority in his hand and he'll be a father to the dwellers of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. What he opens, hmm, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place and he will be a throne of glory for, those, for the house of his father. What is God saying here? The key of David was the person, I don't know what to call him today, vice chancellor, the executive of the house, whatever. That person who holds the key of David holds the key, one, to the treasury, no one go in there unless he allows it. And of course, if you have access to the treasury, wow, what you could do. But the real thing is, he holds access to the king. He determines who goes to see the king, who has an audience with the king. And that is the key we're talking about here. The key of David, Jesus Christ has been given that key. You know what they call him? When Jesus Christ is called? Over there. The door. He is the door. He is the access to God the Father himself, the throne room. There is no other door or way. He doesn't know about it and he is God. So there is no other door or way into God's access. All right? But I'm jumping myself a little here. So just like Eliakim had 
total access to the king's treasures and the king's presence, all right, we're beginning to see that we also gonna have this access. We're gonna have, we're gonna see that how we have this access too. So, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 says, we talked to him about it as a door. In him and through faith in him, we may enter God's presence with boldness and confidence. God wants us to enter his presence with boldness. It don't mean arrogance, eh? It don't mean arrogance. Yeah, he after him. No, it don't mean that. We have the boldness. We could come into his presence not fearing that he is shutting his ears to us. Not fearing that he's going to turn or not fearing that, oh, I'm sorry, he's out for lunch. Could you come back later? Oh, next 10,000 years or so? Because, you know, one day is a thousand years of the Lord, you know? So, hmm. sorry, he's not here today. Come back after lunch. Next 20,000 years. Would you be around for that? Or oh, you wouldn't be? Well, you know, what are we going to do? Such is life. No, he is not like that. God has given us the ability to come before him without fear and with confidence. Confidence that he's going to hear what I have to hear. Confidence I'm not going to get kicked out by them seraphim. Remember we talked about the seraphim and the awesomeness of them. You don't want to be a wrong... You don't want to get on the bad side of a seraphim. All right? The man make up a... Or the creature, can't call him man. He have a face of a man as well as an ox and as well as an eagle and things like that. And he have lightning in his body. You know, like flash, but... Let's still go there. He have lightning in his body all over the place, right? And he moves fast, zing, 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 all over the place, all right? You want to mess with him? Okay, don't even think about it. They're like thrown guardians. So when we go before God, even the seraphim there, seraphim is going to allow us to pass because we have access right into his presence. What does that mean? Hmm, let's see if we can get that out today. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Reading from verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, open for us through the curtain of his body. You see how easy door? And since we have a great priest over the house of God, same door, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. We can't go with him without faith, eh? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we know that he is, um, he is God and he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I can't go to God anyhow. If you're entertaining sin in your life, how can sin come in the presence of God? Excuse me, you have the wrong garments. You have to have a special garment. What is a garment? Not a garment that you can make. It's called the righteousness of Jesus Christ. As you become a child of God, Jesus Christ puts his righteousness on you. You are now clothed with the right garments to enter God's presence. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are to believe that you are clothed in the righteous garment of God so that when you appear before God, you're not doubting, oh God, am I, am I dressed right? Am I, because you had to be fit. You can't be underdressed to come to the, you know when you go to those big fancy parties and people with jacket and tie and you're walking in with a jersey and a sneakers? Um, you know how that feels like? Don't ever think about it. And you have the prime minister or the president, been there, done that. Um, no, not with the jersey and thing, all right? I had to put on tie and thing. Right. Forced to, you know, protocol, whatever. You go before the Lord, you have to have the right thing on. So that means we have to be constantly fighting to keep ourselves pure and in line. If you, if you have done wrong, confess it before the Lord. Just confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive. And come before his presence. He says the door is open. You have the robe of righteousness on Jesus Christ. And you're not coming with sin in your pocket. And you're not coming to ask for something to, um, you know, to help with the sin, make the sin more pleasurable, if you know what I mean. All right? You're not doing that either to consume it on your lust. 
You come in before the presence of God, the king of, of all of the universe. Where myriads of angels bow down and worship him. And nobody has access to him just so. But he has given us access to him. Don't blow it. And make sure you use that access. So, let's go, um, going on in the next verse in Revelation, verse 8, I, and God says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door which no one can shut. For you, have, for you have only a little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So, as we keep saying all the time, the door to the throne room of God is open. No one could shut it. No one in church, no one in authority, no one from any other church, no matter what religion they are, how high they are up in whatever religion they are, they can't shut it from you. Only God could shut it. He holds the keys. No one else holds I didn't know hold the key, but I know the key holder, and I know where the door is, and I have to walk into it. All right? That door cannot be shut. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, you is worthless. You, you can never go and go. You, 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 you is a waste of time. You is the worst thing ever. No. That door is open for you. As you confess your sins and you're faithful and just to forgive you, you walk into that door. He is welcoming you. You are welcome into his presence. Remember Esther? Esther in those days, I mean, things were real tough. The king was so supreme. You can't come in his presence unless he bids you to come. If you walk into that throne room and he didn't call you, he has the right and the law is on his side to say, hey, strike him dead. You're not supposed to do that. Boom, you're dead. If it was so bad in those days, this is what Esther had to go through. How do you think it is right now? God's throne room is no joking matter. This is eternity here. This is God himself, and his throne is much greater than Babylon, the king of Babylon. And Darius, is Darius? I forget, is Darius. Your, his throne room is much greater than that. So nobody can enter his throne room just so, unless the door is open for them. And it is for you, it is for me, who are a child of God, who have been washed in his blood. So what's so special about this open door in this, in this situation with this church? What did God say? You have little strength. Yeah, yeah, you have some strength. That passed by kind of quick in a rush. God said, you have little strength. We may look upon ourselves as being weak in God's sight. And I agree. I am pathetic when it comes to strength in God, as far as he is concerned. You are just as good as me, or bad as me, all right? We have little strength. But the thing is, what was the characteristics, characteristic of this church? You have little strength, yet, what did it do? You have done two major things. One, you have kept my word. Even if you have tiny strength, what you could do with that little strength? You have a little bit of strength? We all have a little bit of strength, tiny strength, mustard seed strength, not faith, strength. What are you going to do with it? What did this church do? Kept my word. Psalm 119 verse 9. And you must read Psalm 119, whole thing, not in King James Version, use something else, NIV or the, um, I like to read the Berean standard, all right? Um, read it in English. It makes a lot more sense. And Old English is nice. I've conditioned myself to read Old English into English. I translate these and those and dies in my mind to he and him and all that stuff. I could do it. I've been it for years. But I want you to read it in like the Berean Standard or the NIV. All right? Read it in that. And read it to yourself. Read it aloud if you could to yourself. All right? You know, when I say aloud, don't shout. I mean, just read it verbally. And put some nuances in it. Put some character in it. Do this. La, 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 la. Read it with, as if it's being addressed to you. All right? Read it like a Trinidadian. Right? With plenty of gesture and emotion and, and make your voice go up and down. Because you hear we sing in a sing song voice. I hear that. Every now and again, I hear it for myself. See, like now? Um, but that's our language. Sing it. Sorry. Say it in your language. 
I just say it by, because it has so much, I learned so much from reading that. I, read, I spent a whole time reading that whole thing, and I was only looking for one verse. And it opened up many things. I said, oh my goodness. All right. 190 verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. It doesn't apply to young men alone. We talk about young men because young men, with all the energy they have, they not only could see sin, they could do something about it, either for good or for bad. As they get older, you see sin, eh. <laughs> you may not be able to do much about it because you're kind of old, all right? No, no, don't, don't just skunk some old people, all right? But mostly to young people, young men, young women, all right? How do you keep yourself pure? God wants us to keep pure, as you will see as we go along even further. All right, how you do? By taking heed or guarding it with his word. His word is what keeps us on the path. The psalmist always shouting about and talking about the, the, um, the precepts of the Lord and his word. They guard your feet and they guide me. Keeps me from danger. Makes me wiser than my teachers. Yeah, you know you have teachers now real dotish. Real dotish. Talking about all kind of nonsense. The word of God keeps us. You know the whole normal thing. You know, there's more than one sex. You know, male, no, gender, sorry. Male, female. No, no, no. That's just two sides of, the, um, of a wide spectrum. All right? And teachers are teaching that nonsense right now. You could be anything. You could be a cat if you want. No problem. We'll treat you as a cat. Meow. As, as somebody had a son who says um, a dog. Right? And you know what the mother do? The mother's parents are as dotish too. Right? took the son to a vet because he identified as a dog. I mean, I don't blame the child, but the mother needs some good clout. All right? Uh, our sister Deborah, Minister Deborah will say, I um, want me to invent some machine or something that I could squeeze that stubbornness out of people's head. I'm sorry. It's impossible. It's, it's in your nature. You, God has to click that out. And not me. It's impossible. It's, it's stuck inside of you. Some people, the eyes will be open. Others, pray for them. But that's how bad the word is. You have to look at the truth of God and let that guide you in every aspect of your life. As a young person, you also have this strength to resist. And with every resistance, with every temptation that comes our way, God provides a way out. Look for it fast and get out. All right? Even though people say you're running, ah, that's okay, I'm running. I'm living to see another day. All right? And you're not going to do certain things to me. As this word, as we'll see, um, if you succumb to that temptation, to thief something from you. You'll see that, yes, you read it, but you'll see just now what they thief from you. They will thief something from you. Anyways, so guard your, your life by reading God's word. The commandments is there for a purpose, not to mess you up, but to keep you safe. To keep you safe. Psalm 119, verse 69. I, I wasn't looking for this verse, but I saw it, and it applies, and it gives me a little key, another key. Let me see if I could, it ministers to me. Let me see if I could get the same thing to happen to you. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Stop there. People bad talk here, and they lie about you. They say all kind of evil, whether your boss, your, your peers in school, in university, wherever you are, your family, they lie and say all kind of bad things about you. What did the psalmist say he did as a reaction? This is not the only verse that says so. I saw this being repeated, even in Psalms 119. How did he handle it? It's strange. I keep your precepts with all my heart. Your precepts, your word, your direction. I answer this lie and this, all these things thrown out my way by keeping to your word, your precepts. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. I shall repay. No, I go take this myself. I'm going to take it upon myself to get back my name. I had to be bad. I had to push my way around. You know, you kind of let your Christianity slip a bit and you put back up the beast that was there before the old man. And you know, like, you think you're turning green and your muscles getting big and you're right and you're going to mash up all these lines. Mm -hmm. What did God say? Don't change the Hulk. You know, I was coming with that, right? Don't change into that beast. 
Follow my precepts. Keep my precepts. Let that guide you. Even if you face these bad situations, they say all the man of evil against you. Yeah, you could start up and talk them too. What did the word of God say about that? You can't lie about them, and you can't um, do the same thing the enemy is doing. Keep my precepts. But it's so pathetic. Mm, that's God's way of doing it, and it's sharp. And it protects you. You know, right now the war in Gaza, Hamas, they are pushing the ordinary Palestinians in front of them to take the fire. Somebody put it this way, you know what they do for a bulletproof vest? They put on a baby. Shoot me now, you know me? And if you had to shoot them, they kill them and they kill the baby. Oh, look, you're killing these innocent people. The enemy don't care. He will put sometimes innocent people in front of you. There's somebody who's getting in trouble right now. A whole set of children came up against them. All right? And you'll get angry, you want to go and beat the living. But if you do that, you're beating children. The law will come down upon you. Satan has a, 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 a way of setting you up. Put the thing in your place, and if you go attack them, you are the aggressor. You are the one who go, go, go to jail. Satan is a setup. He's doing it all the time. Look at what he's doing in Israel and um, Hamas right now. Now Hezbollah taking over, but that's a different story. All that is going on, Satan wants you to get angry, put on the Hulk mentality, and go raging through them, and then he gets you. Look what you're doing. Look how you're getting on. Look how you, uh, I didn't do nothing. I didn't, I didn't offend you. Why are you getting on so far? Of course they offended you. Of course they lied. You didn't know that. But they get you to become unchristian, and then they'll hold you with that. Look how he cuss on get on. Look how he threaten me too. Look how he bung, look how he scratch my car leg and my tires. All them kind of things go through your head. I will take revenge. When I go through your head, go to God's precepts. Revenge is mine. I go handle it. I go handle it good. And I could preserve your name in the process. All right? Watch. Look. And what God said, we go see it again just now. Look. Don't shut your eyes. Look and see what the law gonna do. If you can remember anything, somebody do your bad. Look and see what the law go, how we go handle this. Put them in God's hand. Do not rage. Now, I talking to me too, eh? You know, tra in traffic and people do a kind of bad drive. It goes straight to your head. It bypass go. It go kink. It's a reflex action, monosynaptic impulse. Those who do a little bit of medicine, yink, straight to the brain, right? Reflex. Arr! You want to do something, say something, drive something, do it. Ah, I don't know what it is. Today, coming here, two set of people coming from me. Mm -hmm, going slow and watching around, going slow. I am want to get to church. What you doing? I could have I, uh, had some music on. I say, let me continue praising the Lord. Let the Lord handle it. I go reach, right? And I'm not going to reach with this bad thing in my heart because I had to preach too. I had to represent God. I had to go before his throne. Right now, we are before his throne because we are talking about him. We are gathered together in his name. So we, he is here and he is listening to what's going on and directing everything that is happening here today. So hmm, you see how can I get set up? So be careful of the setup of the enemy. What do psalmists say? He will keep the precepts of the Lord. Nice. Good. Psalm 138, verse 2. All these things are put together to build up on one another and go quickly into the next verse, all right? But I want to throw out stuff that I'm hoping will trigger the right response, the rhema word in our heart, the living word will be triggered on us. It's like casting seed, and as the seed falls, whatever falls and it catches, praise God, you run with it. Psalm 1 today, verse 2. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving devotion and your faithfulness. We did that just now, word for word, actually. All right? You have exalted your name and your word above all else. And next thing, open my eyes there. You have exalted your name and your word above all else. What does that mean to me? Tell me if you agree with it. It means that no matter what situation I'm in, no matter what comes my way, 
No matter what in the universe wants to come my way, God has put his name and his word above all of that. If your parents come up against you, God forbid, because this is what happens if you become a Christian. Some parents are like, what? Especially if you break one religion and come to the next, certain religions want to kill you because you have become an apostate. You left the religion, they want to kill you. What does God say? He puts his word and his name above every situation. So it means that we have no excuse to become unchristian like to handle any situation. This is another level, but you understand why. There is no situation where we could put down your Christianity and pick up the flesh, or the Hulk, or wherever you want to put it. There is none. There is no situation on earth and in heaven. In heaven too, eh? that dimension. His word and his name supersedes or is above, is more important than anything else in our lives. That's why he wants us to keep to his word. His word will take us through. His word will keep us safe. His word will take us even right now into his presence where he is. And you want to touch, uh, talking to the enemy, you want to touch a child of God? If you have done it unto the deeds, the least of my children, yet yeah, you be one to the smallest strength. You've done it unto me. You want to mess with me? That's God talking in on me, eh? That's God talking there. You want to mess with me? That's what happens when somebody messes with you. That's why God say, bless them, pray for them. Because if God has his complete way, I don't know what he's going to rain down on them. They need blessing. All right? This is the God who, who we serve and who died for us. He died for you. If he died for you, anybody want to touch you? You understand? Now, you're not going on a big arrogant look, you know? I am in the... Um, so, you know, I am, what was the word again? I am um, not indefensible. I am untouchable. Untouchable. Nobody, I am so surrounded, nothing could harm me. Heck no. Don't say that. God wants you to trust him. Temptations and tribulations will come. Because you are a child of God, you don't have that? That's a lie. The word God said, so we said it last time. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have it. And you're a member of Christ. Hey, they hate you because they hated me before. And because you represent me. Yeah, people are going to hate you. Yes, get, get real. People are going to hate you. Probably we all know this already. But there's nothing strange. Don't think about it as strange, especially as you're a child of God. And you pray and you look and you bless people. And you stick to the word of God. They're going to hate you. Because you are showing up the darkness. Get used to that. But how are you going to react to it? By sticking to his word and doing his will, doing it his way. Okay. I'm talking so much, my computer's sleeping whenever I walk away from it. Hey, wake up. All right, good. So, the name of God and his word is above every situation on this earth and in heaven above. No excuse. Talking to me too. What's the next thing they did not do? You did not deny my name. Goose pimples with this one. What's the meaning of deny? Well, we know a lot already, but let me look at it. Denying means to refuse. Hence, contradict what you know before. I'm a Christian, but I deny it by involving myself in sin. Anytime we involve itself in sin, hey, let me go and do this now. Let me do that now. You know what I mean? Oh, God, you deserve this, you know. But anytime you involve yourself in sin, you are denying his name. You're denying his word. Because that sin does not represent Christ. Christ died for that. So when we think and we are tempted to go into sin, remember Christ died for that sin. Why are we going into it for? Yeah, we deserve it. We have done so much. 
We deserve. King David, supposed to be in the war, he taken a rest at home. Woman and a naked woman on top of the house. Well, that was happening, eh? a naked woman. On top of the house, he watched it. He didn't turn away. He strained himself. He must have had 20-20 vision, so he could see good. Better my vision, you know, I had to wear glasses. And he planned to get that woman. And then he planned to kill her husband because he had to cover up his sin. All right? The woman got pregnant. <laughs> All right? And he had good sense to say, I am brought in this child. But still, um, we had to get rid of the husband. Instead of bought the child, I bought the husband. And see how sin led to one. I deserve it. I need a little rest. Look, advertising in this house here. Hmm. Sin. Sin God died for. Why are we going back into it? So, I want to go through one person example of denial and see the three levels, three levels. Wherever it applies in our life, let's apply it. But this hit me hard, so I'm going to read it as I get it. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69, reading onwards. You know what I'm talking about. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting out in a courtyard, and a servant girl, a petty servant girl, came up to him. Hey, you also were, was with Jesus, the Galilean. A little piece of girl, what are you thinking she want for? You have witnesses and big men around you, and this little scrawny little girl with a little spinny voice coming. Hey, you, you was with them. That frightening man, Peter, he's a big man. Actually, he's a young man, eh? Big. Anyway, he's a big man. And this girl will expose him. So what did he do? Man, see me? I don't know what you're talking about, you know. And we had it in Trinidad, not me, what you're talking about. We didn't invent that. Peter did it before you, all right? Then another Trinidad and Slam, right? I don't know what you're talking about. So genius, he denied by simply saying that. Are you a Christian? Uh, they kind of hesitate, or you're afraid to bring up Jesus Christ. I mean, don't be a fanatic, you know what I mean? But you deny Christ. So he denied Christ once from a simple thing. It gets worse. When Peter had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to the people, now there are people around him as well, eh? so he had plenty of witnesses. This man, so the girl talking to the people now, he was first one is talking to Peter, now he's talking to the people around him and say, hey, 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 this man. We say, boy, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth, the one inside there, we all want a lynch. This man was with Jesus of Nazareth, and again he denied it with an oath. Now that oath wasn't a cuss word. He said, I swear I do not know him. <laughs> you swear? You make an oath? That's, how, that's the next level. Simple denial. Now you make an oath? No, 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 no. I deny. People have, people have died for saying, I am with Christ. They do that today. You're a Christian, cut off your head. Kill you, burn down your house. That's going on right now. All in many parts of the world. Look what they, he did. He did worse than that. I swear an oath. I do not know this man in front of everybody. So, you know, I'm an upstanding citizen, and I make an oath, and that's final. Who is this idiot of a girl to accuse me? Eh. <clears throat> Such hypocrisy. After a little while, those standing nearby came to Peter. So more of them come now. Surely you are one of them, they said, for your accent gives you away. Because he was a Galilean, and Galilean have an accent, it's a trend. And I know you, I went to Jamaica, and I was, went around with a group in a church there, went out in the country, by some people who was doing some work in a house. And I was talking, talking, and somebody in the house said, hey, I hear Trinidad, you know, I'm accent out there. You hear me, you know me, all right? But you hear my accent, you know what Trinidad was coming. So in that same way, these Galileans with the accent, People are wrong, say, but you're a Galilean. What are you doing here? All right? You must be one of them. And he began to cuss this time. I, put down, I don't deny Christ. Now I pick up the Hulk flesh, and I get vexed now, and I go cuss. Of course, that proves I don't know Christ, because Christ didn't cuss. Right? I have now separated myself by going back to my former way. I have denied Kata Ogum. How much more can where are we in our denial of Christ? Which level are we right now? 
I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Remember? Jesus said, before the, um, the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. I want to look, and this hit me hard. Luke 22, verse 61. Imagine you there and you just denied Christ. As he said that, remember he was in the presence of Jesus. Jesus was nearby, by probably by the door there in the back of the church. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. In the middle of all Jesus was going through, the cock crow. Jesus turned around and watched Peter. Peter denied him in his presence. And Jesus knew it. He predicted it and he looked at him. What went through Peter's heart? What was going through my heart when I saw that verse? There's some look how to put it in. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he ran. That the Lord that you are sworn to protect, that you pull out a sword and chop off somebody's ear. All right? Right? That you said, no, I will never leave you. No, I will stand. Let's build three tabernacles. Let's do this. Let's do that. I am with you. Let me walk in the water. Oh, Lord, I see you healing people. I, uh, all this testimony that Peter have, and he denied God in his presence, and Jesus looked at him. I mean, I would have dead. I mean, I don't know how Peter survived that look. He didn't look at him with hate, because Jesus knew this was coming. All right? In our lives, Emmanuel, God is with us. When we deny God, we are actually and still denying him in his presence. He says, I am with you even to the ends of the earth. We deny God even a simple thing. We do it in his presence. I want that to sink in. It's sinking for me. It hit me hard. I'm hoping by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, it hits you hard too. And remember, as I said in Matthew 28, verse 20, after Jesus said, I'm teaching them to obey all that I commanded, all the word of God I commanded you what to do, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This age, there's an age coming, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, but even to the end of this age, I am always with you. You look at verse 9 in Revelation. Look, remember the look I talked about? Look at those who belong to the synagogue of Satan. The next verse. Who claim to be Jews but are liars instead. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I love you. Look. When things go bad, don't put down your Christianity and pick up the Hulk. Keep doing his precepts. What do you say? Right? Your enemy say something bad of you. Bless them. Bless them to curse you. Even if you could just say, Lord, bless them. Even if you could say it just like that. I've done it. I know what I'm going through. I'm not making it up. Whenever it goes very bad, I know, Lord, bless them. I'm just obeying you. But it hurting me to say it. It, it don't hurt you to say it. I know it hurts you. You're human, just like me. Right? Start that way. Lord, bless them. Next day, they come to mind again, and you start to think about them. Oh, I wish I could. Uh -huh. Lord, bless them. And as you keep doing that on a day, day and time, they come to mind. You say, and they come to mind. Before you do anything else, Lord, bless them. And eventually, you could be praying for them. You, Lord, bless. Open their eyes. Open their understanding. Help them see your way. Lord, save them. The enemy ain't coming that way again, because what? You want to make this man become a Christian or won't become a Christian? Ah! Put his tail between your legs and start running, right? Pray for them. That's what God said to do. Do put on the hulk. All right. So, what is happening here? The synagogue. You know how many Jews in those days? You're a Jew. They know about God. They know about the Bible, the Torah, right? The New Testament was just letters going around at that point in time, all right? So, they, they were taught in the word of God. So, they went back to the family church. 
That's where all Jews go, synagogue. They go back to the family church. So it was the mainstay of um, meeting with people and fellowship with the people. And now they're saying, what, you're Christian? You believe that Jesus is the Messiah? You lie, that's not true. We are the true church. We have an open door to God. You don't have that. You know how the churches today will say that? Small church, we. Who is we? Christians. We wrong. They have the right things. They have all these things we have to do. Of course, we wear robes. We wear all kind of stuff, right? We have so much simidimi we have to go through, right? You are too simple. You just trust in Christ and his righteousness. What's that? That is so simple-minded, right? We know what we're talking about. We were here long before you. Um, seriously. So this is like the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews but are liars. They're not true Jews. They just pretend. When I say Jews, mean belong to, well, belong to the Jews that believe in the Torah and believe the Messiah is coming. Of course, they miss the Messiah completely, right? They were ridiculed. So you've been ridiculed, you've been persecuted, you've been spat upon. They say you is a false religion. Get out of here. You need fellowship. Even your family disowning you because you is a Christian. And they know better. What did they say is going to happen to them? I will make them come and bow down at your feet. It's not worship. It's not worship. They will come and humble themselves before I look, 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 and see. I'll make them come. Some of you may have family like that and friends like that. And they disown you because pss, you are wrong. You disown, you come out from the um, family religion, and now you're, what, who, who, who is this now? No, 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 you're wrong, you small church. When things go wrong, who are they coming to for prayer? Why are they coming to you for prayer and for support? Because you kept on God's word, you kept his word, you kept his precepts, you ain't moving, and they, you ain't cussing them, you ain't fighting them, you ain't getting on bad, they cuss you, you bless them. You show them who Christ is. You have something they want, something they really want. So that is what look and see, they will come to you. Now they're not to come and kiss your ring, eh? <laughs> they will come to you. Do you pray for them? Yes, you have to. That's what God is designing this to do. All right? Good. And they will know, and they will know that I love you. I'm praying that now. What? Yeah. People go through persecution. I'm praying that now those who are being persecuted, that those who the persecutors are will know, know that God loves you. God knows you. God is protecting you. You are favored. You don't have to tell them nothing. I am highly flavored. No, 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 no that don't help nothing. They will see it. They will know it. And they will fear it. God wants it that way. As we stay and we stay as light, as we stay as salt, they will know. They thought that they are the true church and God loves them. They have gone out so far. The modern church has changed everything. And they have changed even the gospel. They've changed the gospel to accommodate sin. Mm -mm, mm -mm. John 16 verse 2 to 3. I hope I'm in the same order. I might be skipping things out. I hope not because I want to finish. This might happen, and this is happening. They will put you out of the synagogues or other places. In fact, it's happening now. A time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. In their zeal, they think they are doing the right thing. But they're so wrong, and the enemy has taken them, and they've... There's a certain religious group out there, right now, all over the world. Same thing with the Jews. Their end of the world will not come. It's in their scripture. 
until every Jew is killed. That's their prophecy. They ha and they are trying to arrange that to come fast. Every Jew, not only in Israel, every Jew must be killed. And by extension, Christians too. Mm -hmm. We don't escape in a rush. Before their God returns. Not returns, sorry. The next kingdom, they take them, their God take them up and put them in a new kingdom. You understand? And they're doing it with zeal. They're doing it with pleasure because they think they're right. People will want to kill Christians. Remember what Jesus said on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They thought, some of them, a lot of them, a lot of them, they were doing the right thing. That's serious business. I just throw it up there to show how serious the hate is to God's word. And you align with God? Then they hate us too. That's why, as you continue to follow the precepts of God and his word, a lot of them will know that God loves you and cares for you. You. Verse 10 says, because you have kept my command to persevere, it is a command to persevere. What? I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Promise, promise. Oh, this is promise. It applies to us too. It's not for them. It's not for Philadelphia alone. It applies to us. What persevere means? The, um, the Greek is hypomone. Weird word, but anyway. Hypo means under, meno means remain, endure. So when they put it together, we remain under whatever burden God puts us under, whatever tribulation sometimes comes our way. Paul was in prison, yet he still preached the word of God and got the word of God out. Paul had an illness in his eyes. We don't know where that he wanted him, the Lord to take away from me, but he still endured. But God's supposed to take away. God is sovereign. He have a plan. He wants us to endure. Everything is about enduring and overcoming. All right? So endure means, um, especially in God in, enables the believer to endure. He, endure whatever comes your way. God is going to deliver. I have overcome the world. You get tribulation. But while you're going through it, endure it. Did God command us to do that? Hebrews 12 verse 1. Remember, everything comes together in the, new, in the um, revelation. Therefore, since we are surrounded, you're not alone. Plenty of people watching you. Surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance. The race set out for us. We have a course, every one of us, and there are obstacles in the course. There's pits, there's mud, there's thorns, fire. God has us going through it. Not around it. Some of them it goes around. Some of the things we have to go through. And as we go through, God is still with us. Remember the Hebrew boys? They were in the fire. Smoke can touch them. Not even smoke, smell of smoke in them, but they endured through the fire and they came out. So God says, commands us to endure. Oh God, my don't. Mm. God commands us to endure. Galatians 8, verse 9. Endurance means you keep on going. I do that, and I drop. No, no, no. Endurance keeps on going. 8 verse 9 says, Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Endure to the end. That's God the one no mommy pami Christian. A Christian is one who endures. A little bit of strength these people had, yet they kept the word of God and they did not deny him. Tiny strength. God said so. Yeah, little strength. Yet, you didn't deny me, and you kept my word. Simple. And that's what we, 
as we were preaching today, do a simple two things. Let's keep his word and don't deny him. Because that's like seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And whatever comes away, hey, tomorrow, you go to work, or you go to school, or you go home, something is going to come in your way. You put it before the Lord, and you endure through it. And next thing, hey, not gone? Whew, Lord, you're good. Boom, and next thing in front here. Hey, welcome to the world. That's our life. For now, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, and I am with you in everything. Titus 2, verse 11. Going on, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. It instructs us to renounce ungodliness. Is there any theme over and over again? Instructs us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives even in this present age, how bad the world is. Do adapt to the world, endure, and stick to the word of God. As we await the blessed hope, and one more time, as we await the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why do we endure? Because unlike other people, we have a hope. If we don't have a hope, give up now. I don't know, if you're an atheist, or whoever's an atheist, why go on living? Life is futile. You live and you accomplish something. Who cares? There's no good, there's no evil. Why are you being good for? Because as an atheist, there's no moral code. Well, humans do this. I don't care. There's nothing good or bad. You're an accident by chance. And your brain was formed by accident. You trust it? Huh? Most depressing. You have to have somebody who you're looking up to. Christ has given us a blessed hope. They call it a blessed hope. What is this blessed hope that we have? Because this is what endures us. Christ had a hope. He endured, he, as an example, he endured the cross and his sufferings. What his hope was to go to be in the presence of God again, to be renewed, to stand before the Father, to be glorified in heaven. That was his hope, and that's what he used. He used God yeah, as a man. He had to have a hope as well to endure the cross. Remember he said, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. I don't want to go through this. If it be possible, if there's any other way, take it from me. What did God say? There is no way. Of course, if anybody say, well, you have to trust in Christ, but you have to wear a scapula. You know what that is, right? Not going to elaborate. You have to do this. You have to do that. Christ died for you, you know, but you have to do all these other things. If that was true, then Christ didn't have to take the cup, and he didn't have to die. God answered him clearly. There was no other way but what Christ had to do on that cross. If there's any other way, why suffer? Because you just have to obey this, do this ritual, do this, and you're good. So the answer to all that stuff Christ had, God answered him and said, there is no other way but what you are doing alone, nothing else. So that's why Christ died for us. But anyway, I was talking about, I just digress there because, hmm, what did Christ say, this blessed hope? He goes on, before, I don't know how to, verse, I'm going to go on to verse 11 because it brings it up again. What's this blessed hope? 11 says, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. I come in personally for you. I come in soon. All right? Hold fast. Oh, oh he said it. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that. When he said coming soon, hold on. He said so. Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Hold fast, grip tenaciously. Don't touch it. I'm being, I'm following the word of God. Touching the word of God. Still touching it, but I want to step into sin. I'm still touching it. No, no, God say hold fast. Hold it tight, all right? I am moving from here. Sin coming, uh-uh, word of God. 
Don't go there, go this way. All right, fine, I'll hold it fast. But what did he say? So hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Where your crown? Let me just say where your crown is. A crown is from the word Stephanos, like St Stefan. I think that's the word as well. Stephanos means mean a crown, but it's actually the wreath. You know the wreath, a victor's crown? You go through and you struggle the athletic. You go through obstacle course. You fly over drain. You run over crocodiles, whatever it is you do in them days, right? You fight lions. At the end of it, you are victorious. They give you a crown that everybody recognizes, and the whole stadium roars in glory as you stand as a victor. That is what we have when we endure. Like the race, at the end of it, God has a crown, Stephanos crown, a crown of victory, not a crown of, of kings. No, no, that's a different thing. It's a crown of victory that you have won with God's help. But don't let someone take that crown, grab it from you. How could someone grab that crown from you when you yield to sin? The moment you yield to sin, that crown go on. Why? Because you fell. You stumbled on the field. And you lost. Yep. You follow the word of God, and God is keeping you. And temptation and sin come your way. And you yield to it. Think about it as you just trip and bust your face. Right? Finish line is there. Christ is coming soon, any moment now. He's coming sunny. The finish line is a kind of um, a finish line that is, you're going to pass that finish line any moment now. Let me see, if you, now we're seeing that, so you follow me. Any moment now, you are going to cross that finish line. Why? That means Christ coming. When he comes, that's the finish line, you know. When you die, God forbid, no, that's the finish line. But the finish line is coming when, uh, when Christ comes. And if he's coming now, if he comes today, that's the finish line. So that's why we're holding on, because we're going to cross that finish line any moment now. Hence, reason why endure. Don't let anybody teeth your crown. Hold on to it. All right, you're gonna cross the finish line. You're crossing the finish line, yes, but you have no victory. So all the word of God you've seen so far is pointing us, keep his word, don't deny his name to get the Stephanos, the crown of victory. And his, his righteousness, his gift of salvation, nobody could take from you. But the crown of victory can be lost. The crown of victory can be grabbed from you. Put that in our minds. Talk to myself here. I have to talk to myself too. So John 14 verse 3 said, Jesus saying, And I go and prepare to prepare a place for you. I am coming, sorry, if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That's the promise. That's the blessed hope. I'm coming for you. I'm coming. Finish line. I am coming. I go to prepare a place for you. And if that's true, because I, I am truth, I am speaking the truth, and if I'm going to do that, it follows that I have to come back and get you. To take you to that place. Oh, and that place is where I am. I want you with me. So he's coming and he promised that. That's the blessed hope. Verse 12 The one who overcomes, come down to the end, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never leave it again. A pillar is a permanent member of the temple of God, it cannot be moved. It cannot be moved. And it has purpose and it has position. There's pillars there. It ain't moving. If you move that pillar, things bad. You will become, who have become an overcomer, you will become a pillar in the what? Temple of God. Temple of God is mean 
the place where God is. Not only where the place where God is, but where the place where God is, 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 is all the time. The, the nerve center of where God is. Central command of where God is. His powerful presence where God is. And that's where we're supposed to be. And God says, you're going to be a permanent fixture in my temple. Where I am. Hey, look at them seraphim flying around. Them powerful um, angels, right? That God in the, um, the throne of God. You'll be high-fiving them, maybe, I know. Um, I'm just saying. Because you're now a member like them of the temple of God. That's where God wants us to be. Oh yeah, it came better than that, eh? Mm -hmm. There is no place, this is how I put it, this is my words. There is no other place in God's creation that is greater than being right where Jesus is. No, he created the whole heaven and, earth, heaven and earth. And there is no place greater in all of creation, including heaven, than to be in the presence of Jesus. Anywhere else, I don't care where you go. I say, I want to see planet Jupiter from close. If I had a body, I know okay, a body could be fly through space. I don't know if we're going to have that or we have technology. When we go to heaven, I could go and fly to these planets or if there are planets around, you know, see God's glory. I don't know. But there's no, I always think of that. Sorry, sci-fi. I love science. Um, but God is putting it this way. There is no place greater in glory and majesty and wonder than to be in the presence of God in his temple. And you're going to be a pillar, immovable, have a right to be right there, and nobody can move you. Woo! Hey, that's hope. That's an extra addition to your hope. And he coming soon to take us there. All right? But it ain't done. He overcomes, I'll make a pillar. And hear what? God is overdue things. You know that. That's our God. I would say he's the God of overdue. Press down, shaken together, and we're overdue. Here's God overdoing in his typical fashion. One, upon him I will write the name of my God. Whoa. Yahweh. What is the pronunciation? We don't know. It lost in history. You know? Uh, you'd hit Vav Heid as the, um, the, the letters in the word. You see it in some cars. All right? They can't pronounce it, but they know that's the name of God. He's going to put the name of God the Father on us. What does that mean? We belong to him. We are God's children. Everywhere we go in heaven, we will have God's name on us. We belong to him. All right? So that's one. What happens when God puts his name on us? And it happens right now. And I want us to look at this Quickly, Numbers chapter 6, verse 22. You know this, but you didn't, we don't read the verse that follows. I don't. I just saw it the other day when I am looking for something, and I saw it. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. And we say that, say to them, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. Next verse, because we don't read this. So they shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. God puts his name on you. He will bless you, even in heaven. So even when we say that at the end of our meeting, right? May the Lord bless you. That's putting God's name on us. Whoa. And because that is being done, he said to do it to the Israelites. When you do that, you put my name on people. And because of that, my name is on them. I will bless them. I didn't see that connection before, but take it for what it's worth. Anytime we say that prayer, God, or that benediction, God is putting his name on us to bless us. So, you belong to the Father. What's the next name? I have a next name to put on you. The New Jerusalem. Oh, yo, yo. A city that is not built by hands. A city that's built in heaven. How much cubits, whatever it is. It's going to come down from heaven. Straight from heaven. Built in heaven. Right? Not on earth. And it's a new earth too, eh? 
built in heaven. What material is built up from? Not from earth, some heavenly material, plenty gold or something like gold, I don't know. But it's coming down from heaven onto earth where everybody in the world will want to be in. But he has put the name of that new city, that brand new city, on you. You are now a citizen of that place. You can go anywhere in the world, the new world God created, but you are a citizen of the new Jerusalem, where God is, where he resides. And the third name, God just overdoing it, eh? Yeah, plenty of names on them, generals, all kind of thing on them. We could be like that. We could have all kind of name and thing on us. Kind of. My new name. Jesus is getting a new name because of what he did on the cross. He said it and it's a name that nobody else knows. Now that's weird. A name that nobody else knows. Nobody else knows it. Well, I've given you it. You have that name that nobody else knows. It's a special name given to me by God the Father. And I'm giving it to you. I'm sharing it with you. I identify with you. You belong to me. Wherever you go, the King of Kings and Lord of Hosts, you identify with him. You are part of him. You are with him. You're one of his. The whole of heaven is waiting in awe and focused on what God is doing here, what God has done for us by stepping out of heaven and dying for us. It's amazing, the amazing glory and wisdom of God. Whole of heaven is in awe. And when they see us, they're seeing God's glory and God's wisdom. And God is not ashamed to identify you with him. That is what God has promised for those of us who overcome. My new name. So, as I said, and I'm finished now, the door is open to you. Keep his word. Do not deny his name. And I didn't put it on the um, thing, but 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, I only talked about it last minute. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, Beloved, we are now children of God. You know you are children of God if you accepted Christ as your Savior. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We don't know what we're going to be like in heaven. We know that when Christ appears, we will be like him. We will look like him. We'll have the same body as him. Whoa, that's scary in a good way. We'll have the same body like him, for we will see him as he is. And this is the part I want us to hear and see and sums up the whole thing. And everyone who has this hope, this blessed hope, in him purifies himself just as Christ is pure. We have that blessed hope. We have an open door into his presence. We have a race to run, and that door is present for us no matter what we go through to get help and strength in time of need. We have a reason to run this race, and we have a reason to not stumble and not fall down. And if you stumble, confess his sins. He make a thing for that. You have medics on the field. He's a medic. He will come. He will fix you up. Get back on the floor. Come on, go back on the course. I've seen people stumble and fall down, right? And they get up and they run. I know they win. That's no excuse for fall down, eh? But I'm telling you, if you stumble, ask for forgiveness. Get back up. Endure. Oh, good grief. Look at the um, pit I have to go through now. Yes? Endure. That's part of the obstacle course. Christ, oh, Lord, help me to go through this. Lord, deliver me from this open door. Nobody shutting you out. And God is going to deliver you. He wants you to win that crown. He, his joy is to give you that victory crown. We're going to do one more thing with that crown. No doubt about it in heaven. We stand with that crown on our heads. The only thing we take from earth that because happens on earth. Yeah, we take something with it. Well, we get something because we did on earth. And we start to praise and worship God. What are we going to give God? You know what the word of God says? They're going to take off your crowns and they're going to cast it before his feet. You want to give something. You know, like how sometimes we give our tithes and offerings. Well, Lord, I want to give you something. We will have something to give. You ain't going to lose a crown that way. You can't lose the crown. You're still a victor. But you have something to give back. 
I just throw it in as a line. Yep. Now come to me. Right? You're before God. You have nothing in your hand. Oh, yeah. Have a victor's crown. Some of us are more than one. And you throw it before his feet. Lord, you are worthy of our praise and glory. The marriage supper of the Lamb is where we're going to meet up. Pastor Sam, everyone else that has gone before us, we're going to have a reunion in the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's our next blessed hope. So run the race, my brothers and sisters. Encourage me. I encourage you as we run this race towards that blessed hope. The finish line is coming any moment now. Let's cross it in victory. In Jesus' name, amen.